Well, thank you, Deb, again, and uh, thank you, Bill, for joining us. Uh, Deb, we really hope you enjoy uh, Vigilance. And, uh, and now for the final uh, act, if you will, in today's uh, meeting program, we're going to be joined by a remarkable panel of industry leaders, all members of the Real Estate Roundtable Board of Directors, uh, and they're going to talk about the challenges and opportunities that uh, people and, visit and, and uh, businesses and cities and the economy in general are facing as we uh, reopen and uh, re-enter re the post-COVID world. So the panel tonight will be moderated by Tom Flexner. Tom is the global head of real estate for Citigroup. Uh, he's responsible for directing uh, the worldwide commercial real estate activities of uh, Citigroup across investment banking, commercial banking, mortgage finance, and real estate private equity. Uh, Tom is going to be discussing all of these matters with his panel that includes Kathleen McCarthy. Kathleen, of course, is the Senior Managing Director and Global Co-Head of uh, Blackstone Real Estate. Blackstone is, of course, the largest, one of the largest real estate platforms uh, in the world with over $120 billion in investment, investor capital uh, under management, uh, and is the industry leader in opportunistic Core Plus and debt investing across the US, Europe, and Asia. Also on the panel, we have Owen Thomas. Owen is the Chief Executive Officer and a Director of Boston Properties. Uh, he's also a Director of Lehman Brothers Holding and served as its Chairman from 2012 to 2013 when he joined Boston Properties. He's also Global Chairman of ULI uh, and a Director of the uh, U uh, Urban Land Institute Foundation. Uh, Mark Perel is also on the panel today. Mark is our newest member of the Board of Directors, having been elected just this afternoon. He's the President, a Chief Executive Officer, and a member of the Board of Trustees for Equity Residential. Uh, he's held various roles at Equity Residential since 1999. He also serves on the Advisory Board of Governors of NAREIT and uh, as I said, is the uh, was just elected to our board this afternoon. It's a great group. Tom, take it away. And um, we'll all sit back and enjoy your, uh, your perspectives and comments. Thank you all. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's Tuesday night. I hope you have a glass of wine in your hand. That would be appropriate as a member of the Real Estate Roundtable. Uh, that's how we got our name. Everybody's in the real estate business. Everybody wants another round and they bring it back to their table. And that's how the Real Estate Roundtable is created. Now, before we get into it, um, I'd like to congratulate Debbie Cafaro for her three years of outstanding leadership as chair of the round table. Debbie, it has been a personal and professional privilege to work alongside you on the board over all these years. Thank you for your dedication to the industry and to the round table. We are so grateful for that. And I'd also like to welcome John Fish as our newly elected chair. John, if you know him, is a force of nature and he's going to continue the great groundwork that Debbie uh, set forth over the past three years. Um, now, as Jeff mentioned, we have three terrific leaders with us tonight to discuss some of the issues confronting our industry, as well as opportunities which continue to spring up as usual. And I'm not gonna say we're confronted with unprecedented uncertainties because that word unprecedented gets used too much, I think. And we've always feel like we're dealing with a lack of clarity about the future just different sources of uncertainty, perhaps. And this time is no different. Some of the big question marks we face are, what is the transition back to work in the office gonna look like? That's on top of everybody's minds. What happens in multifamily world when the eviction moratorium ends this month? And how come so little federal assistance for renters has been dispersed today? Um, we've got continued uncertainty like usual in Washington around what kind of stimulus infrastructure investment programs are gonna get passed. We've got the possibility of significant change in tax laws that clearly impact real estate as well as the economy at large. Um, and we've just seen this week a spike, although not unexpected in the inflation rate, although the bond market hasn't moved an inch as a result. What does that mean? Is it temporary? Is it gonna be longer term? The impact on real estate, cost of capital? Um, and you know, we've seen remarkably an inability on the part of a lot of companies to fill their 
uh, hiring needs for very important workers. They can't get them, even though the unemployment rate, while it continues to come down, remains elevated. And finally, despite all of this, despite the volatility, the uncertainty, the financial markets are trading at record highs. They seem to shrug off risk and everything seems to be priced to perfection. So this is sort of the environment that we're all dealing with and we can talk about some of this or all of it tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to start off talking about the issue that seems on top of everybody's mind. And that is as workers begin to return to the office, what's it gonna look like? What percentage are gonna come back? What percentage are gonna work remotely for the indefinite period? Are there gonna be hybrid models? Are we facing a truly new reality around human behavior, frankly, that could have a decades long effect? And what are the implications of these different scenarios, not just for office space demand and usage, but for ancillary real estate, like urban retail, restaurants, residential, urban residential, that all sort of are interlinked with back to work in the office. So Owen, I'd like to kick it off with you. Um, how do you see this unfold? What are you hearing? And Kathleen and Mark, please feel free to dive in with your views and want to make this very fluid. So thank you all. OT, turn it to you. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, Tom. Also, thank you, uh, Debbie, very much for all of your service. Uh, we're all very grateful. Uh, in terms of the return to office, uh, I would just start off by saying it's already starting. Uh, we're seeing in New York, uh, the population in our business, in our buildings, is uh, achieved about 30% uh, this week. It was at the lows during the pandemic, about 12%. And this is the percentage of people that are working in the building uh, divided by the, how many were working in the building before COVID. So, and, and these percentages are going up, you know, every single week. Uh, if it was 30% this week in New York, it was 25% last week. So we're seeing it. Uh, I'm a, um, a, a suburban commuter. You can, there were people standing on the trains uh, this week. Uh, if you want to uh, have a lunch at a restaurant in Midtown, you better book your reservation 48 hours in advance. You're not going to get one. So clearly the cities, New York, are uh, recovering. But Tom, what I see happening out there is that businesses and employers want to get their employees back in the office. Uh, I, this is across the board. I hear it from our clients. I hear it from other large occupiers who I've spoken with. Working together is a key to corporate innovation, competitiveness, training, and culture. And without, without that, without in-person work, those aspects of business suffer. And when you now switch this to the employees and the workers, they also want to return to the office, but they do want a more flexible model. So what you're seeing right now is a balancing act going on between companies and workers about how is the future of work going to look. And as much as the employers want their employees back, uh, they also are focused on retention, uh, talent retention. And, and I think you're seeing companies evolving their policies, uh, even as we speak. You see some of the big tech companies changing uh, their policies about how much flexibility they're providing on a week by week basis. Uh, I do think um, what all this means is that the future is, of office is all about making the office as appealing as possible to employees. So amenities, uh, ease of commute, are going to be and having a great place and great space is going to be absolutely critical. And you know, if you talk to uh, technology companies, you know their their view is: look, we've been dealing with work from home before COVID. You know, we had a technology enabled workforce; they were able to work from home. And why do you think, you know, we have all these amenities in our space and provide food and everything else? Is because you know we want to get our people back in the office. We want to connect with them uh, through, uh, through our space, and we want to do everything we can to make it appealing. Um, I, uh, yesterday, uh, I had an early morning breakfast across town, and I walked uh, uh, down Park Avenue, and in front of 345 Park, I was delighted to see a big table that said Blackstone on the front of it, and there were people handing out breakfast to, I think breakfast, Kathleen, to Blackstone employees as they were returning to work at 345 Park. 
So I think what you're seeing is a lot of the amenities that the technology companies were providing their employees. You're now seeing it migrate into more uh, traditional industries. And I think, I think that's here to, here to stay. Oh, Owen, do you think, and by the way, look, I agree with everything you said, as does my wife, who reminded me the other day, married me for life, but not for lunch. So she wants me back in the office too. Now, do you think, given what you said about making the office, you know, uh, amenitized, uh, more interesting and, and for employees to come back, do you think that's gonna create at landlord level, a division between haves and have nots in the sense that maybe the best capitalized landlords like you all with the best assets have the ability to invest alongside the tenants in improving the workspace condition. And it's gonna put real pressure on landlords that perhaps don't have those resources to compete effectively. Well, I do think quality buildings are gonna, you know, quality is always important in real estate. It's important in office real estate. And I think it's gonna be even more important in office real estate going forward for the reasons I mentioned. You, you have to have buildings that are easy to get to. And when you're working in them, they have to be great places. And the landlord's got a lot to do with that. You know, what are the amenities that we have? Uh, in where are our buildings located? But the employers have to do it too, because, you know, they build out uh, their space. I also think, you know, having, um, uh, being an, a leader in things like health security and building management is also going to be more important and distinctive going forward. You know, I will say one thing that's interesting right now is uh, a lot of our clients are asking us when they come back to work, they don't want us to have all the visible health security measures in the buildings. They want the stickers out, the air scrubbers, the temperature checks and all that type of thing. But um, factors like indoor air quality, fresh air uh, flow per employee, you know, those kinds of measures. I think our clients are a lot more sophisticated in demanding about those and will be about those types of things going forward. And, and what are you seeing with, re with respect to employers requiring uh, vaccinations? You know, we saw, I think, I think it was uh, my friend David Solomon at Goldman earlier this week uh, said he wants every employee to uh, uh, inform Goldman as to whether they've been vaccinated or not. And, you know, it seems like there's some employers that um, are not going to do that. Some are going to do it. Some are going to require it to come back to office. Many are not. Do you have any sense talking to your tenants? Yeah, I think the, um, it, you know, the key thing you think about as an employer is uh, the safety for the employees that have returned. And I do think a lot of employers are going to mandate vaccines. Uh, or, or do something like what we're doing, which is uh, mandate vaccines or weekly uh, clean COVID tests. So at least you have some, uh, you know, you're not therefore you're not requiring a vaccine, but it, you're giving comfort to the employees that have uh, returned to the office. You know, the other thing, um, uh, Tom, that's important on this, you know, we're working with all our clients now on these plans. But I think generally most of the customers that we have have announced some form of return to work by Labor Day. So they are, um, uh, you know, some of, uh, some of them already have, some are gonna be around July 4th. Some are mandate return to work. Some are, you know, we're just gonna open our office and please come back. But I do think this is all happening this summer. Okay, great. I, I would, um, Kathleen, you know, you've, you've uh, Blackstone's historically been major investor uh, across many geographies and many cities in office as well. Uh, are you seeing the, the uh, scenario that, that OT is outlining across your portfolio in overseas cities and other markets outside of New York as well? Uh, well, I'd say this whole question of return to office and, and whether it happens or how it looks, I think is a bit more of a U.S or you know, market kind of question. When we think about the places where we have assets in across Asia, for example, this is kind of much less top of mind, I think in part because the conditions for working at home are certainly not more favorable than the office. When you think about average apartment sizes, if you live in Tokyo or accessible Wi-Fi and quiet space, if you're in Bangalore, I think additionally, their you know, companies really use the office to maintain a lot of information security 
um, which you know, maybe through technology in the US, we have the luxury of doing whether you're at home or at work, but I think a little bit tougher to manage in other parts of the world. So you know, we, what Owen is describing, we see very much across our investments in the US, I think to some extent in Western Europe as well, but it's not kind of a one size fits all conversation across the globe. Um, you know, I, I, I would just add, I think that this conversation about what does your office offer your tenant or as an employer, what does it offer your employees? I think it's something that's been going on since long before the pandemic. And uh, you know, Owen could speak about it in probably a much more expert way than me, but what we saw in our office buildings, you know, we could have had this conversation two years ago and we would have said we you know, were very focused on having extremely well located in terms of dynamic locations close to transit buildings that were amenitized to attract people to come in, to collaborate, to innovate, because you, know, you wanted to get the companies that were really growth oriented. Those were the best tenants, the most exciting kind of tenants to work with. And I think that conversation, just like so many things with, with COVID has just been accelerated. And you know, we expect that over the next couple of years, there's just going to be a lot of experimentation in terms of the approach. Um, you know, but we have yet to find a company that particularly is growth oriented, creative oriented, or, or has an apprenticeship culture like ours that doesn't want its people back is so important and, and Owen described that well. Great. Um, thank you, Kathleen. And Mark, from, from, uh, from your perch as being, you know, the major multifamily uh, company, uh, how have you been, what's been the, the trend between people moving from urban to suburban uh, apartments, uh, you know, can you can you sort of comment on a what you're seeing from that perspective, and b, uh, you know, has the eviction moratorium act been very important to you? In which case, when it ends, is that a concern? Uh, and c, what's the latest in terms of percentage of rent collected and so forth as an indicator of the health of your markets? Well, thanks, Tom. And first, I do want to also congratulate Deb Kafaro, my friend, on the end of her chairmanship. Um, so a couple of questions in there. So urban, suburban. So equity residential has a predominantly urban portfolio. So our occupancy really did get hurt. We really did see that outflow that we all read about in the newspapers. Um, and that occurred, and I would say, bottomed out in October or November as optimism is built. Um, and I think those folks did a couple of different things. I think there was a pull forward of demand. So if you were a resident at Equity Residential and you now had your second child, which is a big indicator of a desire to move, a big sign that you're likely to, to buy a home, um, those folks probably left. They left and they didn't come back. And I think that's the home builder demand we're all seeing. I think there was a pull forward of folks that would have left us in 22 or later in 21. Um, and I think there were some folks that did go to sort of Sunbelt markets or other spots. But for the most part, for example, in New York, they went to New Jersey. We track our residents by their zip codes of where they're departing because we're forwarding their mail. And it was really just this first circle or the second circle around, uh, again, using New York as an example around Manhattan, whether it was Connecticut or New Jersey. Uh, and then what we saw is the folks coming back and coming back in droves. And so right now our New York occupancy is almost 96%. It bottomed out at 88. Um, so I think our people want to be in the big cities, not just to work as Owen and Kathleen discussed, but because they love the lifestyle. And that's another thing about, you know, some of these great office locations is they're inside of these great cities where you have these entertainment options. So we're seeing terrific demand. And one good conversation we've been having, and I don't have a great deal of evidence for all of this is how is it that my Sunbelt competitors are doing very well in apartments that I'm telling you we're raising rents. We are raising rents so quickly that we had to shut off our lease optimizer because it's not built to raise rents at that speed. So just like, frankly, we had to when it was going down last year, we had to sort of manually deal with it. So how is it the suburban apartment guys are happy, urban guys like me are happy, and the home builders are happy? I think the home builders are happy because they pulled demand forward. I think the urban folks like me are happy because if you graduated from Wharton, you got your MBA or you're a tech worker on the West Coast, you were staying with mom and dad. You got hired a year ago, but your employer said, stay home, stay in your university town, stay home. So these 2020 graduates 
they're going back to city. You guys are calling them back. They want to be back. So they're back. All right. And then you get the 21 class as well. So I think I'm getting the deferred demand in the urban centers. And I do think there are folks that were contemplating a move, whether it's to owned housing or to Florida, and that that demand was pulled forward. And that's our thesis on it. But the recovery, including San Francisco, has been very vigorous and like nothing we've seen before. In terms of the eviction moratorium, you know, I think the landlord community has been pretty responsible in dealing with things, even before all the moratoriums got out. Our company and others and the trade association that we all belong to, we work proactively. The pandemic was no one's fault. And we work with our residents, try to get payment plans. And for our company, it was a less acute issue. We have a real high quality rentership. So we had 97.5% collections to answer your last question, Tom, really every month through the entire pandemic. But that does accumulate over time. And we do have a significant amount of delinquency from past residents that we'd like to collect. And these government programs, which I think it was very well done, both the December bill of 2020 and the March bill of 21 provided this money for these renter assistance funds. The states have been really slow getting that money out, really slow. California is just starting. So I think these eviction moratoriums have outlived their usefulness. And I think when you reopen a whole state like California in a few days and you say you can go to the theater, you can go to sporting events, the courts are open for divorces, contract actions, but not for evictions, I think you're on shakier ground. And the industry has been more active challenging those because I do think the emergency is, is, is dissipating. So I think on the eviction side, it's a tool that's not needed. I do think they'll get extended for a few more months because the states want time to pass the money out. Um, but I, I think they'll, they'll wane as you go into the fall. Great, thank you. And um, very quickly, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the media lately of, you know, a housing bubble. Mm -hmm. Because as, we've, as you've seen the recovery in, occupancies and rents uh, spike in ways that your optimization models can't handle. You're seeing the same thing in the valuation of single family homes and demand for single family rentals. Maybe quickly just explain the interaction of that with your market in terms of how demand gets parsed out. All right. So in our markets, we designed our portfolio, which is in Washington, DC, New York, Boston, Southern Cal, Northern California, and Seattle, and increasingly Denver, um, to not have a lot of competition from single family. So our residents don't move much to single family, and it didn't change that much even in the pandemic. So as it relates to our company, single family ownership or rentership is not, they're, if they're leaving, it's, it's lifestyle decisions. Again, that second kid, they got married, they're going to Cleveland to work, or some big change in their life relative uh, you know, to just saying, I'm, I'm gonna buy a home in Manhattan, just because that cost differential between our rents and buying a home is so significant. So I don't, I don't see a lot of competition, but the interaction is significant. I think single family rentership has become a much more well-organized industry. Uh, I think their technology, a lot of which was originally adapted from the apartment industry. A lot of our folks went and worked at some of those SFR companies. And then I think they took it to another level. I think they're doing some really, really cool stuff. Um, so I think that institutionalized business is gonna, gonna be there to stay. So the interaction is the single family business is larger by a long shot than the apartment business and certainly than the institutional apartment business, but it's market by market. We just expanded Tom back into Atlanta. So equity residential was in Atlanta through the mid 2000s, really a class B portfolio, all suburban. We bought a property in Midtown Atlanta um, and I tell you, it's a different cohort. It's a more affluent cohort, but we thought a lot about single family competition. And I don't usually think a lot about that when we're buying or building in the New York metro area because of where we buy or build. Got it. I'd be interested in hearing, and thank you, Mark. That's very enlightening for me and I'm sure for everybody listening. And, uh, and so Kathleen, look, you've, you've been you know, a major player investor in both the SFR single family market and multis. How is Blackstone looking at the dynamic that Mark just uh, outlined for us? Uh, how, how do you look at it? Where are you sort of focused in the residential sector in the United States right now? 
Well, I would say, um, and, and maybe it relates to also your question about a, a bubble. I, I just think we are um, seeing the impact of a very long period of time where new supply of all types of housing has not caught up with demand. And I think in particular in this moment where you're seeing, as Mark described well, you know, you're having this um, kind of acceleration, you have a, a pull forward of people into household hold for mission or people, and then on top of it, you have people who have deferred those decisions over a period of time, all kind of happening at the same time and really driving up demand for housing of, of all varieties. And in our business, as you mentioned, you know, we, we have rental housing as a high conviction theme, both as you know, particularly garden style rental housing, uh, apartment complexes. Um, and then today you know, we don't uh, have ownership stakes in, in single family rental housing, but we think of it as a, you know, a very interesting part of the market. Um, you know, something, you know, we think about all the time as one, you know, do we want to re-enter as, as a, paired concept to what we do with with our garden apartments um and and i think you know more just generally what has been just very encouraging to see is that this industry which you know, we we help to create with invitation homes has really established itself as an institutional quality asset class um you know some of the growing pains that that we experienced and had to work out in terms of the the service model you know how do you bring a super high quality experience to the tenants I think there's you know, been great development and advancement in that. And and listen, I think single family renting was always a, a, a widespread option. It just wasn't managed in such a high quality way with you know, strong sponsorship. And so I think that's you know, part of what that has made that you know an interesting alternative for renters. And as it relates to urban versus suburban, most of our portfolio today is concentrated in suburban markets, particularly in the Sun Belt. We have some urban exposure in particular uh, in New York and San Francisco, and similar to what Mark described, I think we're seeing the 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 the, the suburban markets first of all stayed you know, very resilient throughout the pandemic, and high rates of collections. Urban markets obviously more challenged, but we're seeing that come back strongly as well. Um, you know, not only um, what we're seeing in terms of being able to wean off some concessions and and start to think about rent growth, but just volume of of tours and inquiries, um, and and in particular from that cohort of young renters. Uh, who want to be in cities. And I, I think that's encouraging, you know, not just for rental housing in cities, but just overall the future of our urban areas. And what's your, what's your, Kathleen, and this would be a question for you in OT as well, because uh, what's your view on urban retail? You know, you may own big office buildings as Boston Property does many times. There's retail anchors on the ground floor that pre-pandemic, were worth you know multiples per square foot of the office, and now many of them have been compromised. How do you how do you get your your arms around that uh, in terms of you know going forward? How would you underwrite? Well, you know, I would say um, what we're seeing is retail of all forms, um, you know, facing headwinds beca because it really has to offer something that's better than an online experience. And and I think in urban areas that retail, whether you're an office owner and it's an amenity to your building or you're, you're operating in a neighborhood and trying to attract um, you know, people for shopping or food or services, um, you know, I think what, what has been challenging to some degree beyond, you know, even pre-pandemic is that as different neighborhoods in a city like New York or San Francisco kind of opened up as places people wanted to live and work, it, it essentially you know, created more supply of retail. And I think for a long time, people thought you know, urban retail, there was only a fixed amount of it because you only had a fixed amount of streetscape. Well, when you create whole new neighborhoods, um, you, you do that. And I think in some cases you saw expansion of in particular, some of the big branded tenants into you know, going from one location on Madison Avenue to five locations throughout the city and recognizing again, even pre-pandemic, this didn't, didn't really work as a business model. And so I think you know what what we think about for our if, if it relates to office in particular is you you want that retail space to be drawing the community around you into your building. Um, this was a big part of our thesis at Willis Tower in Chicago. We didn't want the the space in the building to just be about services and food for the people in the building. We wanted the you know the whole community around it to come in. But I do think it back to the question earlier. It is an important feature for attracting tenants. Um, is to have things you know, people want to be part of in that building beyond just their specific office space. Great. Um, so, and this is a question for all of you because you all have significant urban 
exposures, but uh, when I looked at the survey that came out last week, which I sent to you all, that was prepared by uh, the Partnership for New York City, and it was canvassing, uh, you know, the, the concerns that employees had, ranking them, if you will, as to why they may be reluctant to come back to work. Um, health, health considerations were number one related to COVID, but right up at the top of the list also was public safety uh, in terms of public transportation, in terms of crime on the street. We see it every day, every week in the papers, shootings and so forth. And um, I asked this, you know, from the perspective of the real estate roundtable. I mean, those are problems that ultimately need to be addressed and solved at the local level and the state level. But as, as leaders in our industry, what can we do? Okay, I know that's a crazy open-ended question. Um, and what can the round table do? And I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. And that's for all of you. Yes, I can, I can start. I mean, Equity Residential is very engaged locally. That's really important. So we're talking, whether it's to the city council person, we're talking to the local borough president in the case of New York, we're having those conversations with people because they represent those constituencies. And when you bring people real world stories, I think politicians, you start to get responses. You know, we also do invest in neighborhood, you know, organizations that provide some level of security or sanitation, but mostly I think it's working locally making the argument that a healthy city, for example, a healthy city of San Francisco business district is good for the city. The city relies on those taxes, real estate taxes to run. Um, we make the arguments, and I think persuasively that the real estate industry supports all of these activities in these cities, whether it's covering the city payroll for public safety stuff. So I think you just try and make a constructive argument and you try and engage at that local level. And I think all of us real estate leaders are probably doing a lot more political engagement than we ever did before. But for us, at least, it's being much more involved, Tom, like at the local level than we were even five years ago. And sort of saying, listen, our tenants, your, your voters live with us in our buildings and they're not having a good experience in Chelsea right now. These are the things we see. This is the person who had this experience. This is the note they sent us. Let's do something about this together. And we're, you know, we're having slow progress there, I would say, both in New York and San Francisco. Um, but, but there's more to do. I, I, I think Mark said it well. And, you know, as a property company and also one that's concentrated in a small number of cities, we're very engaged locally um, with our uh, cities and states. Uh, organizations like the Real Estate Roundtable help, but also the Partnership for New York City, which printed the report you referred to. Um, you know, engagement with those organizations is important. I, you know, I, you know, per perception is reality. So this was a survey, and so um, you know, you have to acknowledge that's the perception. I do think some of the crime issue is because the streets are empty. You know, when when uh, the office buildings are ten percent or less occupied. Um, I, th I think the chances, and you have the streets less occupied, I think the chances for crime are higher. I do think um, part of safety is density. And I do think as people return to work, you know, if you think about all the urban centers in San Francisco and New York, I think that will also help with uh, safety and security. Great. I'll, I'll jump in with, you know, one additional thing. O Owen and Mark shared kind of exactly our thoughts, which is, um, we love the real estate roundtable, but I think we're also spending equal, if not more, efforts at the local and state level um, to be engaged for a whole variety of reasons. But you know, one of them being to, to try to help uh, elected officials, in particular, understand the importance of issues like supporting the homeless population, supporting um, a proactive approach on crime, and and also I'd say functional transportation. Um, which is, I think, a really important part of getting people back. The other thing we're doing, we have, I think, starting in two weeks, a, um, a primary election in New York coming up. We have been um, very actively encouraging our employees to be informed, be involved, vote, recognize that in a city like New York City, the primary likely determines the outcome of the, the official election. Um, and, and we've you know, always encouraged people to be civically engaged, but it really has been a new push to help people appreciate that these elections matter a lot um, and they should be engaged. Unfortunately, I think when you look at 
at local elections in particular in a lot of our cities at a very small percentage of the population votes. Um, and I think that's that's really a shame. I totally agree. And, and this primary is very important because we've got eight candidates all over the board in terms of their priorities. Yep. And very few, if any of them really put, you know, the, the, the issue of crime and danger on the streets as their top priority, you know, which really is a precondition to getting the city's economic engine back to where it was. But so thank you. Kathleen, let me ask you this. Um, one of the hardest hit sectors was the hospitality sector. Um, you know, you continue to be a significant uh, player in that market, in that market. Uh, and Clearly, we're seeing, you know, the recovery start, particularly in the more leisure related hotels and so forth. Just curious how you, uh, and I'm curious as a lender too, because we lend on hotel assets. Yep. Uh, I'm curious how your underwriting uh, has changed, how you model uh, future cash flows, how you develop assumptions about where occupancy levels are going to return, you know. How, how, how do you just sort of generically deal with that when you're underwriting new acquisitions in the lodging industry? Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a great question. And, and we similarly look at this from the equity side and also through our debt business as a lender, kind of what, what, what do you want to or what do you have to believe? And, and I'll just uh, preface it by saying when the pandemic really unfolded, particularly in the US and Europe in early March last year, our hospitality portfolio as a percentage of our overall portfolio is probably the smallest it's ever been. Um, and really the most concentrated in I'd say special leisure destinations that were more supply constrained. And, and that wasn't because we saw a pandemic coming and affecting kind of all forms of travel, but it was more that um, you know, a number of, of things in the hospitality market in the couple of years leading up to the pandemic, whether it was new supply, uh, more limited service hotels, um, or pressures on full service models and particular operating costs, you know, just led us to, to try to be in those markets with the lowest rates of new supply, the most different types of demand drivers, um, most experiential oriented. And so I, you know, what I'd say we've seen both through, you know, as we try to do our quarterly valuations and try to underwrite new things is we've been extremely encouraged by just the strength of leisure travel demand. And this we see all over the world, um, even in some places where the hotels themselves are not yet opened up, but the booking window is. So we own a, a caravan park business in the UK that we bought earlier this year, um, very affordable drive to leisure oriented vacation. Um, when we opened for bookings for the summer a couple months ago, again, the properties weren't even really open yet, um, we saw three times the demand we would have had in 2019. And so what that tells us is that you know, people are wanting to get out, wanting to travel. Similarly, here in the U.S., the Cosmopolitan Hotel had, had record New Year's and Super Bowl weekends. Um, and, what we're, and what was kind of more longer dated in terms of our underwriting would be how, how long does it take for business travel to normalize? And importantly, when do conferences and conventions and group travel kind of return. And I, I think that, you know, our view is that that comes back in exactly that order. We, we are believers that business travelers will be back on the road. Um, many of us already are um, here at Blackstone. And I think we're hearing that you know, from others as well. People you know, are, are, have been living really for 18 months off of relationships built over years. But at some point, you know, that, that needs to be re-energized, re reinvigorated. Um, so we see people getting back to travel. Now, will there be a slightly different composition? Will people do you know, modestly less? Will they have fewer internal events? Because um, you know, Zoom has you know, proved a very democratic way of getting people together, potentially. But um, you know, I, I think one of the pieces that we saw was encouraging this week was the Las Vegas Convention Center's opening. They have their first convention. You know, our view is that it's going to take a few years and it, it's going to be a ramp back. But we're going to see kind of all of the different forms of hospitality, um, you know, really coming back. It, it's just a matter of, you know, exactly what pace. But I, I would say to date, if you think about what we're thinking today versus what we might have thought six or nine months ago, I think it all seems to be happening faster. Great. Thank you. What do all of you think about uh, the, the recent inflation data? I, I'm, I'm sure lots of people in the audience are, are, you know, they, they ha they're, they're dealing with questions of how should they manage their capital structure, 
right? And, you know, people that I've talked to, some say this is a temporary spurt, you know, because of supply chain disruptions, because of, you know, demand for, you know, pet food, since everybody was buying pets as an example and causes that product to go up and so forth. Mm -hmm. Others are tying it to, well, you know, look how much the federal deficit is growing. Look how much the Fed balance sheet is growing. Um, it's going to be a longer term problem, you know. And me as a as a Wall Street expert on interest rates, my prediction is very precise. I think there's a 50% chance that interest rates go up. I can't get any more accurate than that. And Owen, I see you up there front and center. You you spent decades on Wall Street. What do you think? Oh. Well, Tom, interest rates are awfully hard to predict. And, uh, you know, the, inf the inflation is real. Uh, and I think it does have an impact on real estate. You know, when thinking about is it long term, it's just amazing to me that inflation is going up and, it, and the 10 year has been going down this week. Um, so it, markets not really telling us that they think this is a long term impact. Uh, but it does have impacts on property. I mean, when you know, our, we're a big developer. Uh, the projects that we've already started are bought, so that doesn't have an impact. But it makes future projects more expensive. And you know, again, so that maybe maybe that means then uh, we and other developers will start less projects, which means less supply, which means higher rents. And if it's uh, more expensive to recreate everything that we own, you know, that is in a, in an indirect way a positive uh, for real estate. So it's a it's a challenging time to predict, and um, you know I've I've kind of learned in my career interest rates are always very hard to predict. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo. I think um, uh, I and we've probably never gotten interest rates exactly right. You know, we we've for I feel like now a decade have been predicting higher interest rates, and I yeah. in very few quarters were we really <laughs> in that kind of environment. But I, I I agree with Owen. It based on you know what we track and and what we're seeing in our portfolio, everything from materials costs, labor costs, Tom, you mentioned earlier that the challenge of getting people to come back to work, particularly in some of our operational assets like hotels, you know, having to really offer higher wages to do that. Um, additionally, just lease trade outs in our rental apartments, and I'm sure Mark can comment on that. Would, would, and knowing that housing is obviously a very big part of core inflation, I think um, it would suggest we are in an inflationary environment. Um, tough to believe interest rates won't respond to that um, at some point. I think, you know, it's just very probably, I, I believe very difficult to manage a soft landing of how that, how those two things come together. But I think the, the inflation is, is real. And, um, and are, you, are you seeing in your development projects, are you, are you seeing um, increased difficulty in getting supplies because of supply chain breakdowns and so forth? You know, we read about that with microchips and everything, cars, smart cars can't get made, but is it already beginning to impact on the construction side of your business? We're, we're not seeing it so much in terms of timing. There's clearly an impact of cost, but I, I, we haven't certainly had anything be delayed or projects be delayed because of the supply chain issues that you mentioned, but costs are up. Yeah, on our end, even renovations are delayed, we've seen because of appliances. So I had someone tell me recently, you're, you're being hurt by the semiconductor shortage. And I said, what semiconductors are you talking about? And it, it's all the appliances we buy when we do renovations. So we are seeing some delays there. I'm of the opinion that a lot of this stuff, I was on a call with a bunch of home builders yesterday. And they talked about very specific problems. You know, they can't get trusses, they can't get, but they were very specific, Tom. And my thinking is, just like a year ago, it was hard to get masks. It was difficult to get any kind of PP&E that the system will adjust itself out. And the other thing, as we prepared, our company did for the NARIT conference that just ended, we were thinking about inflation. As we all talk more to generalists, Owen and I, you know, the idea of inflation being good in real estate, we had to go back, we had to use NACREF data from the 70s and 80s. I mean, we, we just, almost all of us have relatively limited experience with managing through inflation. It's typically been good for the apartments with our shorter dated leases, but you know, we had to go all the way back and it is indeed true that apartments outperform in inflation in 1970 through 1990, but I, I don't have anything more recent to say. So I'm not sure I'm afraid of inflation unless it comes with stagnation as well, um, in which case I think all business is in a, is in a ditch. 
Well, you know, unfortunately, Mark, I, I also date back to the 70s when I got in this business. So, you know, I remember those, those days. And back then, in terms of the commercial real estate food chain, at the top of the food chain were regional malls. Now, you can see what happens after 40 years, right, under extreme pressure. But they were, they were at the top of the food chain because they all have percentage rents, right? collecting a percentage of sales. And back in the early 80s, when you had 10%, 12%, 14% inflation, a regional mall was the ultimate real estate hedge. Of course, times have changed. But you know, to your point, you have to go way back to really understand the correlation between real estate performance and inflation. Do you all have any questions you want to ask one another? Well, maybe I'll I'll just ask you, Tom. I mean, we uh, sort of to turn it around, and uh, you know, I'm curious, kind of what you're seeing and your approach from the the seat you sit in, both in terms of you know you mentioned it's a real I've I've thought pre COVID now really exciting time for real estate. Obviously, huge changes underway, kind of from a macro trend standpoint. It sounds like everybody here agrees that the pandemic has accelerated a lot of things. Um, how are you approaching that in your business? Well, you know, the I'm, I'm responsible for both the lending side and the investment banking side, and it's a global business like yours. And we actually work together in many markets in, in Asia, Australia, uh, Europe, uh, and of course here. And from my perspective, uh, you know, as, as Owen said a, a couple of minutes ago, how strange it is to see this spike in inflation at the same time see bond prices rise and yields go down. It's like, it's like a disconnect. And I think it caught everybody by surprise a year ago when the Fed stepped in and, and, and the Treasury stepped in, the, the, the sheer amount of liquidity that immediately just spurted outward, right? I mean, the markets, the real estate markets today are as liquid as I've ever seen them, both debt and equity. Uh, the, the REIT indices are uh, above where they were pre-pandemic. Uh, the cost of capital is, you know, in the basement because the 10 year is, you know, 1.5 and your typical, you know, conduit loan is a three low 3% coupon. Uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable. Um, you know, we are as lenders, uh, along with the industry in general, you know, continuing to be, you know, cautious. Uh, the regulators want us to be cautious. Uh, they're very focused on our office exposures and our hospitality exposures. Office because of the back to work concepts that they're thinking about and hospitality because of how crushed it got. But we're, we're lending in, in both sectors. Uh, you know, the, the flavors of the month in recent years have been logistics, data centers, and so forth. Uh, logistics, you know, are, are viewed as the sort of perfect hedge against almost any scenario <laughs> occurs. Okay, if, it, if 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 things get bad and people don't want to go to out the shop, they order over the internet, and that's a hedge. And if things are great again, they go out the shop. But the malls need places to store their wear inventory. So that's been and that's been a a sector that you guys are incredibly involved in. Um, I think, you know, we, we think we're going to probably see uh, the CMBS market uh, about a, th a third higher than it was last year. You know, pre-pandemic, it was basically a $100 billion market. Uh, 2020, I think it was around 60. And our own internal sort of trend line show it probably being 80 unless there's some, some unforeseen event. But the, but the interesting thing is the mix between conduit financing and single asset secured borrowing uh, is, is turned upside down. Historically, conduits have been two thirds, single asset, one third. We think this year is gonna be the exact opposite. And that's also because there's still sort of resist, residual risk 
fears in the minds of investors. You know, when you're when you do a conduit securitization, uh, you know the the lower tranches are basically taking the concentrated risk of defaults, uh, and so we're seeing a little less demand for that. But overall, I think we'll, we'll see volumes up by a third. I think we'll probably, sorry. Go ahead. So Tom, I, with all that, what should we all be worried about? Uh, the world feels so good. We've got this return to work, real estate's up, um, capital is plentiful. What, what's Citibank, what are you worried about? I, I think, yeah, well, I'll, I think one of our primary worries as an industry and just generally is cybersecurity risk. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, we've just seen in recent weeks, you know, it hitting a major meat producer, it hitting, you know, the gas pipeline. Um, I, I, you know, I think, I, I'm gonna get this statistic wrong, but, you know, there was a meeting of, of the cyber sort of security people amongst the banks. I think our bank, BAMO and so forth, we probably get over a million hits a yeah. day by hackers trying to get in. So, you know, I think that that's a number one risk. I think there's regulatory risk, which, you know, uh, Jeff DeBoer, I don't know if he's listening and still on here, but, um, you know, we have, we don't know what, what's going to unfold in Washington is, is, is the inability to get anything done a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. I don't even know the answer to that, right? There's some things I definitely don't want to see get done. And there's others that do, but you know, it's the political equivalent of stagflation. I don't know what's going to happen, but that's got to, there's got to be a, a policy risk out there as well. And, um, you know, and of course, you know, we, we are, we're concerned about environmental risks, not just from a social humanitarian standpoint, which is obviously, we're all concerned about that, but the implications long-term in different parts of the world. I mean, we, you know, we work in a hundred different countries. So we're the most global bank, um, you know, JP Morgan's pretty global and so forth. And there is really, there are differentiated outcomes in terms of people being able to feed themselves get access to water. What, what are the implications of that in a completely interconnected world? We think about that a lot, worry about that a lot. I don't think you have anything to worry about though. Anybody wanna add anything else? I think we're pretty much hit the timeline. Thank you, Tom, for organizing this and for coordinating our conversation. Thank you, Thanks, Tom. Mark. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure. All right. Terrific. Take care.